So next I'm going to deal with Galatians. There's no particular order that I'm doing this, by the way. I'm just picking a passage and then finding something on it and cracking on. So I'm going to do Galatians next, particularly around uh, the 5 and 6 area. So he's used Galatians across several different video so he's not exactly done a big chunk where right this is where I deal with Galatians but he, he spread different things that he has to say about Galatians across different videos depending on the point that he's trying to get across so we're revisiting this video again everyone who lost their salvation and uh, after the Simon the Sorcerer example where he didn't actually say that Simon lost his salvation by the way he, his next answer is um, Galatians so he introduces his point saying that the, the, Paul said to the Galatians in 5.7, you were running well, who hindered you from obeying the truth? Um, and I'm, and then he, he goes on to say uh, this bit next, uh, I am astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. Now, if you look in the transcript, about this is about 4 minutes 35 in, so he points out the 5.7 verse, but then he goes on to say, and then he said... Now, again, this is just the the way that he reads the Bible. Paul did not say that and then say that, because if you just look at the numbers, this one is four chapters later than this one. Now, now maybe that's just a slip of the tongue. Maybe he just did it by accident. But like he's starting with towards the end of the book and then going back to the beginning of the book. And again, this is the way that he reads the Bible, like a convoluted conspiracy board. It's like he thinks that Paul the Apostle is like the Tasmanian devil. You just give him a pen and he goes... Blah, 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 blah. It's like you can't just write a normal letter from start to finish. Well, first he said this at near the end of Galatians, and then he said this at the beginning. No, he said that this at the beginning, and then he said this. But maybe it was just a slip of the tongue. I don't know. And so the crux of the matter that he's going to get across in Galatians, that that supposedly means people lost their salvation, is uh, 5, 1 to 4, where he, he has to tell the Galatians, submit again, uh, do not submit again, sorry. You are severed from Christ. Uh, you have fallen away from grace. And so that, that bit there is, is how he would justify um, that you can lose salvation from, from that passage. And I'm going to kill multiple birds with, with one stone. So in another video where he's giving a death blow to grace abusing eternal security, apparently, uh, he quotes a, a later chapter in Galatians about sowing to the flesh versus sowing to the spirit. And he goes on to say that uh, Paul gives us four things we, we must do in order to reap eternal life. And again, notice how it's it's all self. It's just no Jesus whatsoever. It's all about what you do, typically. Um, but uh, th this is the kind of thing where he, he takes this verse here about he who sows to his flesh from his flesh will reap corruption. That that means hell. That's how he interprets it. And then this bit here, uh, reaping in the spirit, reap eternal life. That that means going to heaven. So that that's how he's reading reading that. So we'll we'll need to explore that as well while I'm on Galatians. Now, uh, some people, obviously, Osas folk will have confronted him about that and said, well, well, anybody who falls away was never saved. But then he's going to ask the question, well, somebody who isn't a Christian, how can they sow to the spirit for a little while? And, and then give up. Um, so again, because he's seeing it through the lens of that's what it means that they lost their salvation. So uh, we'll, we'll kind of explore those th three themes in, in Galatians. Now, first, let's look at the, the target audience here. And obviously, yes, it's, it's Christians, it's the brethren, but we'll be a bit more specific about the nature of the audience that he's addressing his letter to. Because Epiusi on Apologetics is going to take the, the Galatians 5 bit about fallen from grace, and he's going to make it about you. Like, you personally can fall from grace and lose your salvation. That's how he's going to frame it. But that, that doesn't really work in the way that the letter set up as to who it's addressed. So... It's, uh, it starts out in verse 2 that it's addressed to uh, all the brethren, with, sorry, sorry, that's all the brethren which are with him, on to the churches of Galatia. Now, emphasis on the word churches, okay? This is a plural audience. It's written to lots of different uh, congregations at Galatia, okay? So we've got plural there. It's not, it's not written to one person. This is not an instruction about one person. So we immediately have a problem when you start taking verses about, well, see, you can lose your salvation because look, all the churches at Galatia didn't all collectively lose their salvation. That's, that's ridiculous that you would read the Bible like that. Now, in the King James, you don't actually get this from uh, modern translations, but to, a, to an extent, you can obviously use the context. But the King James shows you that it's it's ye as opposed to thee and thou. So again, it, it's a plural audience. He's 
written, writing to churches, it's a group of people. This is not about one person uh, particularly. Uh, so, you know, that you can't just take something that's written to churches and say, well, you personally can lose your salvation because of Paul's letter to a group of people. That that doesn't make any sense, okay? So, you are so soon removed from him that called you, again, plural, it's ye and you are plural, uh, into the grace of Christ, onto another gospel. So, there, there's the issue, where obviously the risk here is another gospel. That's the, the danger that's approaching the churches at Galatia. Uh, which is not another, but look what he says, and this is key in verse 7. You must understand this. There be some that trouble you. Emphasis, some that are troubling you. So again, is it that all the churches in Galatia have all been given over to this bad gospel and they're all just losing their salvation down to the last man, woman, boy and girl? Sorry, that's not how this ha is happening, Epiusion. You are wrong again. The churches at Galatia have got some among them that are troubling them who are perverting the gospel of Christ. It's those some, it's those specific people within some of the churches of Galatia that are causing this problem, okay? So it immediately, the, the you can personally lose your salvation because of Galatians is immediately falling apart just by looking at the, the issue that Paul's trying to address. A few verses I didn't put on my tablet, but then I thought it would actually be good to just go, go to those briefly. So after verse 7, when he says, there be some that trouble you, he then goes on to say, but though we, and that is obviously a, a group of people that's alongside Paul there, or an angel, and that, that can just be one angel, an angel, preach any other gospel than that which we have preached, let him, so that's a personal one person uh, pronoun there, let him, that person, or whoever it is, be accursed. And just in case you missed it the first time, he rephrases it in verse 9. If any man, so is it all the churches of Galatia? No, if any man preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. So the one that preaches another gospel is the one that's accursed here. That's the strong language. Now, when he says fallen from grace, that's not strong language, like being accursed is strong language. So these people that pervert the, go the gospel, there's some among them. And if any man be one of those that, that trouble you and pervert the gospel, it's him that's accursed. It's not all the churches of Galatia that are accursed. But, but there's a danger of this false gospel creeping into the church of Galatia. A little leaven leavens a whole lump. So obviously they, they've got to start purging that. They've got to start cleaning up house. Okay. And Paul gives us an example from his own life. He profited the Jews' religion, but then it pleased God to separate him uh, by calling him to his grace. So when, when Paul was doing all of this stuff and profiting the Jews' religion with their false gospel, that was before the grace of God. He wasn't saved when he was doing that. So these people that are occurred, they're not saved. They don't get saved and they lose their salvation. They are unsaved people among the Galatians that are troubling the Galatians, okay? And, and it's those trouble causes that are the accursed people, okay? So again, this is a group of people or particular individuals or particular uh, camps of people within the churches of Galatia, plural, okay? So context, it's all about that. So then let's fast forward to um, Galatians 5. I'm not going to do anything about between 2 and 4 because it's, fo it's mainly 5 and 6 that we're focusing on for some of the stuff that EPUC has said. So uh, he introduces 5, uh, stand therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Well, well, what has he made us free from? Well, the, the overall flavour of the letter is that he's made us free from the the law that that's what he, he we've made been free from okay that that's our liberty we're, we're not under the law as, as he will explain elsewhere in in this letter all right now then let's look at verse two so he says if ye and there's that there's that plural you there so here he is addressing all recipients of the letter if you are circumcised and, and presumably because he's dealing with false gospels this is circumcised for the purpose of the gospel for your eternal life. We're not dealing with like, you know, you just have to do it for a medical reason or you just want to do it for some reason or you were already circumcised because you're Jewish. It's if you seek to be circumcised for the purpose of the gospel for your eternal life. Okay. Uh, well, then if that's the case, Christ shall profit you nothing. Okay. So in other words, it, it doesn't matter if you believe on Christ. If you mix circumcision in with the gospel, the, there is literally no point in believing on Christ. What What is that supposed to do for you? And so, um, you know, th this is again where the faith plus work stuff starts to creep in. Uh, so he, he clarifies that further. For I testify again to every man 
that is circumcised. So while the letter is addressed to the churches in Galatia, again, it, it's those some that trouble you. Any man, that, that particular man that, that is one of those that trouble you, it's every man that is circumcised for this purpose that Paul's dealing with. He is a debtor to the whole law. So if you're a debtor to the whole law, you, you can't just say, well, okay, we ought to follow this particular law, but not all of them. No, if you want to be circumcised, you're a debtor to the whole law. Either it's all the law or not the law, because as the Bible also explains, you, you break one, you've broken the whole law. We, we we saw that earlier with James, okay? Now, keep that in mind, because that's going to be very important with some of the upcoming verses that we're going to deal with, and again, more of where Epiusium just continues to just embarrass himself. So... Uh, either you follow the whole law or or we're not we're, we're not under the law it, it's that simple it, it, it's it's both extremes here so you can't you can't be under the law and also believe in Christ to be saved it's, it's got to be one or the other and so here's the really crucial bit the, here then Christ is become of no effect unto you okay whosoever of you so again not not like you personally or like all the churches in Galatia or anything like that whosoever of you are justified by the law so anybody that's among the Galatians who think they are justified by the law they are the ones that have fallen from grace okay so this is not someone who's firm in their beliefs that it's by faith this is someone who thinks that they are justified by the law okay now then, you might wonder, because obviously Paul does use language like, um, uh, so for example, he says fallen, right? And then he says become of no effect. So then it, it, it might look like, well, he was once in effect for you. The, the problem is, though, that we don't really have a lot of background about the people that trouble them that he's dealing with. That he, There's nothing really that indicates they used to believe it was by faith, but then they started believing that it was suddenly by works for, for some bizarre reason, okay? But again, remember that we're dealing with a, a plurality of people. We're dealing with churches, and so it's the danger of people among you, so the some that trouble you, they're the ones that are perverting the gospel of Christ. So this is... Uh, people among them so you can't then just take that statement to say that oh well you can lose your salvation because first of all you would have to be somebody for this to be true you would have to be somebody who used to believe it was by faith and then suddenly decided that it was by works all of a sudden okay well I, i've never really known anybody uh that i've ever known fall into that camp okay usually it's the opposite way around people used to be believe it was by works and then they realize that it's actually by by faith the next thing to look at is notice what Paul says they're actually fallen from. He says they're fallen from grace. So he didn't say you are fallen from salv salvation. That's not what he said. Sorry, it's not, it's not quite catching up with me at the moment. He didn't say you've fallen from salvation. He didn't even say eternal life. Okay, that's not what Paul said they fell from right? It, it, that's just not what he said. Simple as that. And again, if you want to say this is a you can lose your salvation passage, well, again, you're going to have to speak with Paul on Judgment Day and explain to him why he wrote this letter so badly, because he could have just said, you have lost your salvation. He could have just said, you have lost your eternal life. That's what Paul could have just said. So he just spell it out for us. He didn't do that. So don't change the words that Paul actually used that the Holy Spirit moved him to speak. He fell from grace that's what he felt from and so it raises the question then what is grace what is it that they actually fell from that's what we need to understand well it's simple we just need to know exactly what grace means well if we were to look in the dictionary you have things like unmerited divine assistance or a virtue coming from God. But obviously, the problem is that with religious def definitions in the dictionary is that they are religiously biased. So that those definitions could have been shaped by Christians interpreting it this way. That might not be the secular or standalone meaning of grace in itself. But then you look a little bit further, and it's got words like approval, favour, uh, mercy, pardon, privilege. So it seems to be favour, but as an act of kindness or, or courtesy, not not something that you uh, just have earned or, or deserve particularly. And it, it can mean different things across different places uh, in the Bible, uh, but it is tied into uh, the gospel in, in many places. You, you can see some of them on the screen there that they, they believed through grace, uh, the gospel of the grace of God. 
um, and, and so on and so forth. And then when you get to Paul's writings in like Romans and things, it's it's all about we're justified freely. So again, that's that justification for righteousness. It, it's freely through God's given grace. So it's something that God gives us, but it's something that we we haven't earned. It, it's not like it, it's not you know it's it's not a debt. It's not like a reward. It, it's the it's grace. It's unmerited. Okay. So we could call it then God's undeserved favour or God's undeserved kindness, something that God gives you for free. You, you don't earn it. You don't deserve it. So that's why Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for by grace are you saved through faith, because it's the gift of God. It's not of works. He can't boast in them. So this group right here, the people that Paul is dealing with, these whosoevers, these particular people among you, so not all of you, but whosoever of you, why did they fall from God's unmerited favour? Well, it's quite simple. They thought they were justified by the law. They're not, because we wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. So again, you can see why Paul said similarly in Romans, we're justified by faith without works for righteousness. Not the same thing that James was talking about when he said by, justified by faith and works, because James wasn't dealing with our righteousness specifically. Okay, so in Jesus Christ, if you have the faith, it doesn't matter whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised. It's faith which works by by love. And of course, again, Epiusium loves to take that word work right there and say, well, see, you've got to be doing works. But that's not what that says. It's that faith works, uh, faith which works by love. So that that's the love that's working the faith. OK, so here's the problem. Then. If you still want to take that, that statement right there, fallen from grace, as meaning you lost your salvation. Well, the problem with that is that just about everybody who believes you can lose your salvation thinks that they're justified by works. And if you're justified by works, well, you're a debtor to the, the whole law. You can't just say, well, there's New Testament works versus Old Testament works, because a lot of the things that the New Testament tells you to do are things from the Old Testament. So we'll see more of that as we progress through Galatians. And it just shows where Epiusian's false dichotomy between works of faith versus works of the law just completely crumbles and falls apart. OK, so then verse uh, seven is where uh, it, it's the verse that Epiusian quoted earlier. That, well, you see, you did run well. Who hindered you that you should not obey uh, the truth? Well, again, it, it's dealing with a plural audience. And we already know that there are some that trouble you. We, we already know that going into this verse. OK, so don't you know, don't let him get away with playing tricks on you with this verse. And another trick that he tries to pull as well <laughs> is that he tries to pick on this word obey or say it says you must obey this is what you know you must be doing these things to get to heaven well obey what because it doesn't say obey the law is that what it says no does it say obey the the, the commandments of jesus is that what it says no that's not what it says it says obey the truth okay well how do you obey the truth well if the truth says that you're justified by faith and not by the works of the law for righteousness and you think you have to do works of the law for righteousness you're disobeying the truth okay if the bible says that jesus died and rose again you know for sins and you think there's some other way of doing it well guess what you're disobeying the truth you're not following the truth that the apostles left with you and the truth that they left is that salvation is by grace through faith without works that justification unto righteousness is without works that whosoever believeth in him should not perish not whosoever repenteth of his sin shall not perish so you know any of these false gospels like surrender your life to christ or repent of your sins they are disobeying the truth quote unquote now they might be obeying some of the commandments they might be obeying thou shall not steal but they're disobeying the truth though okay now in 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 the case of the churches of galatians paul goes on to say i have confidence in you that through the lord you will uh, be none otherwise minded but he that troubles you shall bear his judgment again whosoever he be so again it's not all the churches in galatia are going to lose their salvation or anything ridiculous like that but the, the, those that trouble them, they're going to bear their judgment, whoever they are, okay, because, because they're bringing in this false gospel. That, that, again, the whole, whole background of his, his argument points here. So uh, he then goes on to say, I would that, that they were even be cut off, which trouble you. So, you know, it'd be better if, if you didn't have to deal with them, because as he said earlier, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And so ask yourself this question. Why are there millions and millions and millions of Catholics out there bowing down to statues of Mary. That's not in the Bible. Where did it come from? Well, the thing is, it's not like Christians just woke up one day and started bowing down to statues of Mary. What you'll notice is a lot of heresies that have crept in 
they've crept in gradually. Okay, so, you know, it started off, well, all well, the bishops got to give you the bread. And then it started off, well, you, you know, you've got to start being baptised to actually be saved. Oh, well, then now it's got to be this. And what happens is it, it, it's gradual. It, it's not just something that, boom, let's all just do all the works to be saved. Because if you said, right, let's obey all of these works of the law to be saved, well, someone's going to go, hang on a minute, that's that's not what uh, Paul's been telling us. So it's it's all these gradual things. And so circumcision is just one of the, the gateways to, to this happening okay that's what that's what you must understand about this obviously we don't want to take a little leaven like a circumcision and then leaveneth the whole lump where it just flat out just becomes work salvation because that's that's what most of christianity is today all the catholics think you have to do the sacraments to be saved all the seventh day adventists and jehovah's witnesses think you have to be doing a bunch of works to be saved all the evangelical and protestants think that you have to be turning from your sins to be saved okay it's all works 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 there's different amounts of works in different groups but that's what it all comes down to it's just a slightly different form that it takes all the pentecostals you know think that there's got to be this speaking in tongues and all this but maybe not all of them but that, that's what a lot of it's out there it, works are creeping in there somewhere okay uh, and this is how it creeps in it's just a little leaven and it leavens the whole lump okay now then verse 13 is a really good verse because it, it ties in paul's whole point while answering the objections that people are typically going to throw at us when, when we point this stuff out okay so you have been called it says onto liberty okay that's what you've been called on right well what is liberty well liberty is like another word for freedom well what what freedom or what liberty do we have what what are we set free from well it's simple if you be led by the spirit you are not under the law he explains that that later so under the law it, it's the opposite of liberty and, and again remember when we looked at james there was the royal law but you will be judged by the law of liberty. Well, how do we be judged by the law of liberty? What What is such a law? Because it, it, if liberty is the opposite of the Old Testament law, it can't be the same thing. It can't even be remotely similar. But, well, the thing is, you're not under the law, okay? Now then, you might wonder, what does it mean to be un, not under the law anymore? Well, the thing is, when it comes to law and, and, and legal ease, in the secular world, we, they don't really often use the phrase under the law okay rather they use its opposite in that there's this phrase above the law so if someone thinks that they can literally do what they like and the rules don't apply to them and there will be no consequences then in that aspect they think they are above the law but the whole point of saying it in in legalese is that no one actually is above the law that that's supposed to be the whole point of it okay so this is not a complicated concept at all if we have the law well, if you're under the law, then the rules and their associated punishments for breaking those rules apply. Whereas if you're above the law, they they don't apply. Okay, so essentially, because you're not under the law, the punishments that come for sin under the law don't apply. Well, you know, what is the law? What is the wages of sin? It's death. Okay, that's the, the punishment for sin. Well, that, that rule doesn't apply anymore because you're not under that law, right? Now then. Even though we're under liberty, okay, even though that does apply and we are not under the law, as Paul said, nevertheless, despite what he's just said, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, okay, but, but love one another, love and serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, that you shall love your neighbour as yourself. So again, here's the problem with the way that Epiusion frames his gospel, because he would take that statement, you shall love the, uh, your neighbour as yourself, as one of the things you have to do to be saved. Okay, here's the problem with that though, folks, is that to love your neighbour as yourself is fulfilling the law. Okay, now that's Old Testament law, it's an Old Testament commandment. Now you might wonder, well, well, what about, doesn't Paul talk about in Galatians about the law of Christ as opposed to the, the Old Testament law? Well, that is coming up, but he hasn't talked about it yet. So contextually, we're still under the old law. That's the same law that circumcision was found in. This is an Old Testament commandment. It's an Old Testament law. It's not some magical new revelation 
in the New Testament, okay? This has always been in place. So it's still the Old Testament law. Now, it's just explained that, you know, you're not justified by the law. You've fallen from grace if you think that, but you are justified by faith. Nevertheless, you shall fulfill the law if you do this, but you're not under the law, okay? So this is liberty. The law can't hurt you, but nevertheless, as long as you do this, you shall fulfill the law in any case, okay? So here's what we're saying. Here's what free grace says. Yes, obey the law. Yes, love your neighbor. Yes, love your God. Yes, do the works of the Spirit. Yes, do these things. And yes, do those good things in the law. But guess what? That's not going to help your justification onto righteousness. That's not going to help you get saved. And the reason why I point that out is because Epiusion just loves to straw man faith alone and free grace and osas as just saying that we want to justify sin and go on sinning. Well, the thing is, folks, that's just a lie. It's just a false accusation. And the thing is, it doesn't even bother me that he wants to falsely say that we say that. Because you know what? In Romans 3.8, Paul actually pointed out that there were people that slanderously affirmed that he said, let us do evil that good may come. Well, guess what, Epiusion? Your damnation is just for falsely affirming that we say that because we don't affirm that. Now, do you think Paul would have been accused of saying something like that if he said, repent of your sins and do all of these works to be saved? No, you know what? We, we get accused of saying that by Epiusio and apologetics. Well, you know what? They falsely accuse Paul of saying that. So go ahead, Epiusio, and make your false accusation because all you're doing by doing that is you're affirming us and you're vindicating us and you're really only dismantling yourself okay you're, you're just proving yourself to be these people whose damnation is just when you falsely accuse faith alone and osas of wanting to go out and sin okay we don't want to go out and sin all we're simply saying is let's understand the separation between the liberty and the law and the purpose of each okay now then so when he says uh, you shall love your neighbor as yourself what what's the opposite of that what's going to happen if you don't do that. Well, he goes on to explain in verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, oh, you will lose your salvation. You will fall from grace. You will forfeit your eternal life. Oh, wait, that's not what Paul said. And if you could lose your salvation, you'd think that would be pretty important for him to mention it here. He doesn't say it though, folks, does he? He said that you be consu not consumed one of another. So if Christians, saved Christians, are constantly trying to devour each other and attack one another and bring each other down, that's not going to be beneficial spiritually for them, is it? But again, if it's so important, it's so dangerous that we can lose our salvation, this right here, um, that's not really the least, that's the least of our problems, okay? Losing our salvation would be our biggest problem. For some reason, Paul didn't seem to want to mention it in verse 15. Why? Because it's utter garbage that only people like Epiusio and Apologetics would believe, okay? It's just simply not the reason for the opposite of loving your neighbour, okay? This is the danger right here. This is the thing that Paul is warning us about. You will consume one another. He doesn't point out that you lose your salvation if you don't love one another, okay? Don't put words in Paul's mouth that Paul didn't say. Don't make Paul sound like a crazy person for giving us all the wrong information to work with, okay? Now that he gives us some practical advice here. If you walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Okay, so that and there's kind of a battle going on here, and he details this battle uh, much more in Romans chapter seven. So I think after I've done Galatians, we'll go and look at Romans because uh, Epiusion always loves to abuse Romans eight. And uh, that's got a lot of similar themes to what we're reading here in Galatians. So we'll deal with Romans after we've dealt with uh, Galatians. But there's very similar themes here. Is that what's happening is the flesh lusts against the spirit, okay, and the spirit against the flesh. These are uh, contrary to to one another. Well, what what is the effect of that? It's so that you cannot do the things that you would. Okay, so it's you would do these things. Yet it's saying you, you cannot do these things. And this works both ways. You see, your flesh wants the alcohol. It wants the fornication. It wants the pornography. It wants the cigarettes. It wants this. It wants that and the other. But the spirit is there so that the flesh cannot do these things. But it doesn't just say that the spirit is against the flesh. It also says that the flesh is against the spirit as well. So what does your spirit want to do? Well, the spirit in you, the Holy Spirit living in you, wants to learn more about God's word, wants to give the gospel to the lost. That's what the spirit 
would do. But the problem that the spirit has is that the flesh doesn't want to do these things. And so the spirit cannot do these things when it should be doing. Okay, so there's a, the flesh and the spirit warring against each other. These are, these are contrary to one another. Okay, the, these are both within you and they both want to do the opposite things. Because you as a Bible-believing Christian... You know that the pornography and the alcohol is wrong. You know that it's wrong. And the spirit in you, the, the Christian in you says, you know, what? I don't want to do that. Yet the flesh itself still has the urge to want to do that. OK, those of you that have had a history of uh, drunkenness, of alcoholism, there's still a part of you that, that has some sort of addiction that wants to do that. OK. Those of you that struggled with pornography, you know that if some woman's walking in the street and she's rather loosely dressed, you know that there's a temptation within you to want to look at that. And yet your spirit also knows that you shouldn't be looking at that. And so that's what Paul's describing here. It's that war there. And so we can talk more about it when we look a little bit at Romans 7, because Paul gives us a lot more detail to go on. But the point is that these two are uh, going against each other. Okay. So that's why he says you have to do the walk so that you shall not not fulfill. OK, it, but that's that's a walk. It's a it's a practice. It's something that you've actually got to walk in. That is something that you have to do for this uh, particular purpose. OK, now then, how can you possibly walk in the spirit? How, how would that even be remotely possible? Well, the thing is, it says in verse 18, if you be led of the spirit. So in order to walk in the spirit, the spirit's got to be leading you if the spirit's not leading you how how can you possibly walk in it you you don't know who he is or where he is or what what it is even so leading the spirit it's the spirit that's leading okay there's the emphasis there now if you are led by the spirit so it doesn't say if you fulfill the walk but rather it says if you fulfill if, if you are led by so it's it's the spirit leading you okay you are not under the law so it doesn't say you are not under the law if you walk in the spirit you are not you are not under the law if you are led by the spirit okay so it's the fact that the spirit leads you not you walking in it okay that that's why you're not under the law well we know that the holy spirit is given to those that believe because that's what john chapter 7 says so you have to believe to have the holy spirit in you to then lead you okay and if the spirit is leading you you are not under the law so the, the law has no more dominion over you it, it can't it can't condemn you for, for you know, the, the sins that you have done because you are led by the Spirit. You are, you're not under that law, right? Now, now the walk, obviously that's something that you do, okay? And it doesn't say walk in the Spirit so that you shall maintain your eternal life or anything ridiculous like that. You walk in the Spirit so that you shall not fulfill, fulfill the lust, okay? But in order to not be under the law, okay, it says that you have to be led... Well, who does the leading? It's the spirit that does the leading. OK, you being led, that's that's not like an active verb that you're doing. It, it's a it's sort of like a passive verb. It's something that you're receiving. Okay, The spirit is leading you and you're not leading the spirit. It's something that the spirit is doing to you. But you walking in the spirit, that's something that you're doing. So it's the spirit that causes you to not be under the law. You walk so that you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. OK, so don't don't confuse these two things here and it's all again just emphasizing why salvation is about what christ did it's not about what you do what you do is not the cause of you going to heaven what christ did is the cause of you going to heaven okay nevertheless you are commanded walk in the spirit why because use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh that's what he's trying to get you to do here that's the objective of this letter so paul's just making a separation between you're not under the law so things like trying to be circumcised and trying to do all these works for the gospel is not going to help you you're under liberty so those of you under liberty well because you're led by the spirit now we can start talking about walking in the spirit so it's making a separation between the works of a believer and what you actually have to do for the gospel, okay, which is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that thou shalt be saved. Now then, he goes on to explain the works of the flesh, okay? What are the works of the flesh? What does the flesh work? What does it do? They're, they're manifest, in, in other words, another way of reading it is it's made known, it's made apparent that the flesh is adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Okay. And then you've got the murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Okay. And uh, he goes on to do, uh, I have told you in time past, this is on something, he said something similar to uh, the Corinthian church, that they which do such things shall not 
inherit the kingdom of God. Now then, here's the problem, is what, what, what most people miss. You see, people then look at this statement, all which do sh such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And they'll say, oh, well, see, if you start falling into these works of the flesh, you won't inherit the kingdom of God and, you know, you will lose your salvation. And, you know, here comes the works out again. Okay. Well, again, here's the problem. Here's what they're failing to grasp. Okay. What is it about adultery, for example, or what is it about fornication, for example? Or what is it about idolatry or witchcraft, for example, that is wrong? Why is it wrong to do those things? How do you know that those things are actually bad, okay? Is it wrong to own a house? Well, there's nothing wrong with owning a house, okay? Now, the flesh, this stuff here, pro for, for many people, wants a nice house, okay? It wants the six bedrooms and the big uh, rooms and you know it wants the nice curtains and we saw Epuseon has a fairly nice house but but those things aren't wrong though why is it not wrong to want a nice house because there's nothing in the old testament law that says it's wrong to have a nice house okay but all these things right here we we have laws against these things okay the law tells us that these things is wrong and so here's why salvation or righteousness being justified by the law or by works doesn't work pardon the pun okay because the law says that these things are wrong and the law applies to your flesh the problem is is that the flesh wants to do those things in the law so for example the flesh says thou shalt not commit adultery sorry the law says thou shalt not commit adultery that's what the law says it's wrong to do that and there is a punishment for that the problem is, is that the flesh does those things, okay? The flesh wants to do that, and so the flesh goes against the law to do those things. But Paul has already explained, he's already said this, that if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law, okay? So, again, it's no accident that Paul uses careful language here, okay? So let me just clear some space up here. Let me show you the language that Paul uses is choosing to use being a man who was moved by the Holy Spirit to say these things. Because if Paul wanted you to believe that you could lose your salvation if you do these things, and if Paul wanted to believe you to believe that all these things apply to you not inheriting the kingdom of God as somebody who's already a Christian, then he could have just said right here, he could have just said, if you do such things, you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But that's not how Paul chose to phrase it, okay? He said, they. That's what Paul actually said. It's if they which do such things, okay? They, people that are in the flesh. They're people who are not led by the Spirit. And so they may even know that this stuff is wrong, but they choose to do it anyway. You know, you look out at the wicked world, the non-Christian world, why do they go out and commit fornication? You know, why aren't these people not waiting to get married? Why do they go out and cheat on their wife? Why are they full of uncleanness, okay? Why are they full of these other things in here? Why are the people going out and doing witchcraft? You know, these people doing witchcraft, folks, do you think the Bible believe in Christians or do you think they're a bunch of pagans and wicked people, okay? They do those things and they are the ones that shall not in inherit the kingdom of God. But he's already explained, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law, okay? And we already saw examples earlier. Why did the publicans and harlots go in before the chief priests and Pharisees? The chief priests and Pharisees probably weren't harloting around like the harlots were, but it's because they believed. That's what Matthew 21, 32 explained, okay? And then again, look at the non-accidental language. It's not that Paul doesn't know how to write a very good letter, okay? He's using his words very carefully. Look down at verse 24. They that are Christ, so they that belong to Christ. It's not they that have repented of all of their sins. It's they that are Christ's. Have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. And again, look at what he says. He says, have crucified. He doesn't say they are crucifying by dying daily. Okay. They have crucified. That's past tense. The flesh has been crucified. Okay. Why is the flesh being crucified? Because they, they are Christ. They live in the spirit. That's their born again spirit. 
Jesus talked about that when he talked to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He said, uh, you've got to be born in the spirit to enter the kingdom. He doesn't say you've got to walk in the spirit daily. You've got to be born in the spirit. Okay, well, if you're born in the spirit, well, now the spirit can lead you. So, you know, John started off with the simple language, like being born in the spirit, whosoever believeth in him in that same chapter, that which is flesh is flesh, but that which is spirit is spirit. It's the spirit that's born again, not the flesh. Okay, the flesh is not born again. So if we live in the spirit... Well, then he says, let us also walk in the spirit. OK, so because you live in the spirit, if you're one of those people, if you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that you've been saved by faith, without works, by God's grace. Well, let us also walk in the spirit. It's not walk in the spirit so that we can then be live in the spirit. We live in the spirit. So let us also do this. So walking in the spirit is something for the believer. It's not something to get saved and maintain your salvation. Let us also, having been already saved, having already crucified the flesh, let's also walk in the spirit. And so this is what Paul's trying to get across. He's already explained that you've got flesh and spirit against each other. Now, it says we have crucified the flesh, yet here it is, it's still living, okay? But it is getting older, okay? It is decaying. It does get sick, okay? The flesh wants to do those things that are up there, okay? You being born again didn't magically make you want to just suddenly stop doing all these things and never want to do them again. That's the very reason why it's called works, okay? For, for many of you, it's hard not to do these things. Now, you know, everyone's things are different. Paul's making a generalised statement here. I personally don't have a particular... Uh, desire to go and do witchcraft okay that's not an issue for me okay but you know not looking upon a woman to lust after these bits right here well that's harder for me okay some of you maybe it might be something different maybe you don't struggle with uh, that one there you know maybe you've got the incontinence of Paul there but but you struggle with some of these other things here okay what whatever things they happen to be so this is Paul's whole point here okay we're not under the law so we will inherit the kingdom of God because we live in the spirit we are led by the spirit however don't use that as an occasion to the flesh let's also walk in the spirit okay now why should we do that because you know we don't want to devour one another that's why we should love one another okay and again it, it doesn't take a genius to figure that stuff out because now notice what he said in verse 22 he said the fruit of the spirit now often when people read the word fruit they automatically assume that it means works okay so they they just like when john says bring forth fruit well that means the works well no because fruit is not work okay fruit is the product of work right so these are the works of the flesh this isn't the work of the spirit this is the fruit of the spirit okay it's it's no accident that Paul is using this language. Now, your average person today probably isn't a farmer, but back in the time of Christ and the time of Paul, many people were farmers. So that's why you have a lot of these shepherd analogies and these farm analogies and these seed analogies and these vine analogies, because a lot of people were farmers. That, that was the main economy. So the work is something that you have to do. You have to put in the work, okay? You have to do the walking, okay? That's what walking is work. You have to be putting in the walk. You have to be putting in the work. But what what is what 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 happens when you work? You see, you have to plant the seed in the ground. You have to water the trees. You have to work in the garden. Gardening is something that takes a lot of work, and that's why I'm rubbish at gardening. And no house that I've ever lived in since I moved out of my parents has had a tended garden. I am useless at gardening because I'm just not prepared to put in the work for for literal gardening. Okay, but walking in the spirit. Well, walking is the work. The fruit is the product. If you've put in the work to grow a proper garden, well, then you can expect eventually your garden is going to grow something. If you've put in the work to growing like a, a, a vine tree, like, a, you know, you can expect to harvest grapes from that. The grapes are the fruit, but the grapes aren't the work. The work is the work that you put in to get those grapes. So what is the fruit of the spirit? Well, it's, it's love, okay? It, it's joy and it, it's peace and it's long suffering okay and it's gentleness and it's goodness okay and it's faith now all these are good things okay and even the unsaved wicked world to some extent 
still wants these things. You know, isn't everyone always banging on about how we'd, we'd love to have world peace, for example? Isn't that what they always say? At, well, I don't know, because I don't watch them. But like beauty pageants, it's kind of like a, a cliche. Oh, I want world peace, you know? Um, doesn't the unsaved world want love to some extent? Don't they want joy? It, it, it doesn't take a genius or a born-again person to want these things. But the problem with the unsaved world is that they're looking in all the wrong places. You see, they think that there's something they've got to do for their eternal life. So they want these things, but they're not going to get these things because they're looking in all the wrong places. They're not looking to Jesus for these things. Okay, why? Because they're in the flesh and they haven't been born in the spirit, they're not led by the spirit, so they don't live in the spirit. Okay, because they don't live in the spirit, because they're still under the flesh, they haven't believed on the Lord Jesus Christ that they shall be saved. That's why they're not getting any of this fruit because they're looking in all the wrong places okay but we who have been born again those of us who believe christ those who believe it's by grace through faith not of works those of us who aren't working into salvation we've entered into rest as as the hebrews terminology tells us well because we live in the spirit well then what we have to do is now walk in that spirit that we're living in so that we can hope to get some of this fruit and, and who doesn't want love who doesn't want joy who doesn't want peace no normal person doesn't want those things okay any normal person wants those things because they're all good things but you're not going to get those if you think you have to work your frigging way to heaven you're not going to get those if you think you have to do buddhism and try and get nirvana you're never going to get peace okay if, if you think that now buddhists want to bang on about peace all day long all right but sorry but there's no nirvana and no salvation in buddhism okay you're not going to get peace you can try for it as hard as you want okay and when god judges you as being those who will not inherit the kingdom of god that's going to be the very opposite of peace all right so Again, this is why Epiusion's apolog so-called apologetics is a terrible gospel. It will never get you this fruit. And that's why he constantly has to do these stupid videos like, when, how will I know if I've kept my salvation? How will I know if, you know, how many sins before I lose my salvation? Because everybody who's stupid enough to listen to him is never going to find peace. They're constantly going to be scrambling around trying to get this peace and never quite getting there. Because they've constantly got this problem, the flesh, okay? They're constantly trying to obey the law, but the law is something that applies to the flesh, okay? Those that are in the spirit are not under the law. Now that we're under the spirit, now that we've got that out of the way, believe on the Lord, get saved. Well, now let's talk about walking in the spirit. You see, walking in the spirit, it's something for people that are saved. It's not a step to get saved so don't reverse the order yes let's walk in the spirit yes let's get some of this love yes let's get some of this joy let's get some of this peace but your works are f to get those things it it's to get that fruit it's not to be saved okay being saved is by grace through faith case closed it's not by works and there's no such thing as new testament works versus old testament works or, or some stupid stuff like that because most of these things are old testament laws that's a lot of what christ preached that's what loving your neighbor involves it involves doing some things that are in the law but we're not under the law but nevertheless as long as we love our neighbor then we shall fulfill the law okay if we walk in the spirit we won't fulfill these lusts okay this really isn't that complicated folks okay and all all we're trying to do here all we're trying to explain to you in free grace theology is that it, it is good to do these works and it, it's good to get some of this fruit of the spirit this is good stuff but not to be saved you are not going to enter into the kingdom of god because you do those things okay doing those things is for people who are already in the kingdom of god all right if we live in the spirit right do you live in the spirit yes no right okay yes you live in the spirit you've been born again right let's walk in the spirit then let's get some work done okay that's why ephesians explains after he already explains that it's by grace through faith and not of not of yourselves not of works god has ordained us on two good works because you have to get saved by the faith without the works the grace of the faith without works to then go and do those works to be ordained in those works and here's the problem with epiusion they take the stuff that's the life of the christian and they put they put the cart before the horse as the saying goes okay and that's why this repent of your sins gospel to be saved doesn't work you've got to first believe when you first believe then we can deal with turning from your sins okay and that's something that i've explained in my repentance for salvation video 
So moving on to uh, Galatians 6 then. So obviously the chapters didn't exist when Paul wrote this letter. So it really just carries on going from 26. That There's no new thing here. So uh, following on from what he's just said, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, so uh, what do we do to such a man to whom this happens? Well, you which are spiritual, so we, we can take spiritual as to be those who are better at walking in the spirit, those who are who have these fruits of the spirit because they're doing the walk. Well, then you who are more spiritual than the man who is overtaken with these faults, and by fault, we presumably mean these sort of fleshly sins up here. It doesn't say restore his salvation, help him to get his eternal life back, make him repent of all of his sins so he can be saved all over again. It doesn't say anything like that. But it just says restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Well, well, restore him unto what? Well, it doesn't say exactly, but if we just take the context of this verse, it's restore him out of this fault that is overtaken him. Okay, that that's the restoration. Get him out of that fault. If he's got a problem where he's doing he's let's say he's got a problem with drunkenness well you are spiritual and not struggling with drunkenness restore him back onto soberness okay that that's all the context that we've got to work with nothing about losing salvation and he says bear one another's burdens and again this is like the love thy neighbor thing so doing fulfill the law now Again, Epiusion, in, in his videos about Galatians, tried to trick you into thinking that, like, the law of Christ is, is, like, separate from the Old Testament law. So, you know, these are the works that we've got to be doing to be saved. But once again, we've already we've already put so many holes in that because a lot of what Christ tells you to do is Old Testament law anyway. And it says you have, the Bible said you have liberty, okay? It, Paul already explained this earlier, that you're under liberty, you're not under Old Testament law. Well, obeying the law is hard, that's why it's called works, okay? Because because of the flesh wants to do these things above, that's why it's hard to do works, that's why it's hard to obey the law. Well, you can't really then say that we're at liberty if we're set free from that law, but then there's this other law that applies, and you've got to be sacrificing yourself every single day, and you've got to endure all the persecution to the bitter end, and if you don't make it to the bitter end, you're not saved. Well, you can't say that we're under liberty there. That's not liberty. That's still being under a law, and it's a hard law. That's hard works, okay? So that, again, that just completely falls apart. And if you were to say, well, we're not under the law, but we're under the law of Christ, well, the, the problem is that the Bible doesn't strictly define exactly what the law of Christ is. But if we're going on the context that we've had so far in Galatians, well, then logically, the only thing that the law of Christ can be is liberty, okay? So salvation entering into the kingdom of heaven it's liberty it's rest it's simply believe it's by grace through faith not of works but as christians we walk in the spirit and so we fulfill a, a lot, all these laws anyway because now the spirit helps us to do those things you see the flesh without the spirit doesn't have any help the spirit gives us that help okay and again, it's the spirit that's being born again. Your flesh will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Your flesh has been crucified, he said earlier. Your flesh is still dead. You are still a dead man dying in your flesh. It's the spirit that's going to be saved. That's the aspect of you that's actually born again. Okay, this is what Paul's trying to explain. And he also explains it in Romans as well. And you know what? Let, let me ask you this hypothetical question. Okay. Now, I'm using more of a man-made argument here, I accept that, but just think about this. Just just use some ounce of just common sense and just logic for one miserable day, okay? And I mean that to the people who listen to this guy. Who do you think loves God more? Because if, if we have to love God to be saved, well, well who go loves God more? The person who does all these works in the hope that he's going to get something out of it and hope that he's going to go to heaven because he does those things... Or the guy that's going to heaven for free, even if he sits back and does nothing, but goes and do, does those works anyway. Okay, because Epiusion wants to bang on about, are you doing all these things? Are you walking in the spirit? Are you obeying all of these? And have you turned from all of your sins? Uh, you know, you're not going to make it to heaven. Well, guess what? Even if I didn't, even if I did nothing for God, I'd still be going to heaven because it's a free gift. But guess what? There's loads of people who believe in faith alone and one saved, always saved who were doing that anyway. So who loves God more? The person who's trying to get something out of God for doing it? Or the person who does it over and above what he actually needs to do? Because we don't need to do those things. You see, 
when Epiusion goes out evangelizing, he we we saw an example of where he's just screaming in a field with hardly anybody in it, okay? Getting nobody saved because it's just repent of your sins, which has no power at all. But you see, there are independent fundamental Baptists out there and, and people like that who are actually knocking on doors, speaking to people one on one, having a meaningful conversation, and their faith alone, and they're one saved, always saved, and yet look at them giving up their Saturday to go and do that while everyone else is just staying in bed or watching the football or whatever and doesn't want to talk to them because they're so busy watching the football. So they they don't even need to do those things. They could sit on their backside at home doing nothing for God and still get in. And yet there they are going out and do the, doing those things. Why? Because they're the people that love the Lord their God and they're the people that love their neighbour because they're doing work that they don't even have to do. And yet there they are doing it. So just logically speaking, who loves God more? Does the person who repents of all of his sins to get into heaven love God more? Or does the person who doesn't have to repent of his sins at all to get into heaven and yet still repents of his sins anyway? Who, again, who loves God more? You might then ask the question, well, well, what about rewards? Isn't that something that you're trying to get out of it? Well, to be honest, nobody that I know it constantly bangs on about that. It's not really part of our everyday conversation it's not really something that we think about so when i'm out soul winning with my buddy james nelson we're not really thinking about what rewards we're going to get we're, we're thinking about the soul of the person who we're going to preach to that's what we're really concerned with but even so it doesn't change the fact that heaven itself is still a free gift and if we sat on our butts doing nothing we'd still be going so it still work over and above what we have to do to be saved and so yeah we acknowledge that there is a thing about works but then the thing is as well if i'm struggling with sin every mistake i make and every fault i'm in is still counting against me on those rewards so if we are concerned about the rewards we'd still be repenting of our sin anyway so uh, you know he's, he's going to try and trick you with these arguments don't let him deceive you don't let him walk circles around you okay don't let him get away with it so to wrap up uh, Galatians 6 and, and really bring it to a close is uh, this bit, verse 7 and 7 to 9 in Galatians 6. And so this is where uh, he's going to say that these these things, these these works that we must be doing to, to reap eternal life. And by that, he means you earning, because that's, that's what reaping is. It's, it's bringing in the, the things that you've been growing or working in a farming context you will work that eternal life okay you, you will you will bring that in for yourself your eternal life if you do the, those things and, and he's using this passage so if you uh you know don't sow to your flesh do so to your spirit do good don't give up etc so that that's what he's arguing here about uh, a minute and a half up to about three minutes in okay now in his works of the law uh, video he essentially he argues from the the same passage Galatians 6 so he's saying that well you can only reap eternal life and again it means that you will earn your salvation if you don't give up so you you keep on fighting with the works of the spirit there otherwise uh, you know you, you won't earn that that salvation so he then sort of asks a hypothetical and he addresses it so Christians will have confronted him and said well if somebody isn't saved and, and they gave up and, and they uh they they're not saved it's because they were never saved to begin with and so then he has to address that because um he he's arguing that how how can a person sow to the spirit quote unquote so let, let's just get that back up there how can a person sow to the spirit if he's not saved and so that that's a question that we'll just briefly answer as well and later in his works of the law video, about six minutes 20, and this is where he says, if you sow to the flesh or, or what he equates with walking in sin, then you will die. But if, if you sow to the spirit, then you will live. And of course, what, what he's, he's now paraphrasing, he's not quoting exactly what Galatians 6 actually says. He's now paraphrasing it and he's making it about, well, if you sow to the flesh, aka walk in sin, you will die and go to hell. That's what, that's the, the substance of what he's saying there because that that would be the opposite of eternal life which is what what the spirit reaps okay so we're going to look at that because how he's framing it again is problematic with the words that paul actually uses and again further towards well towards the end of this video he then says what what paul is arguing here in galatians that these works of obedience what he's saying is instead of obeying the old testament law we now have a new law or the law of love, as he's calling it, or the law of Christ. And so 
that Paul's telling us we need to obey this New Testament law, the law of Christ, to love your neighbour as yourself. You have to be doing that work. But again, it just shows how he completely butchers the Bible, because instead of just reading it like a normal letter, he's going like that everywhere. Because we've already looked at these verses, okay? When Paul mentioned the law of Christ... That's in chapter 6. He hasn't mentioned it until then. It's in chapter 6 that he mentions the, the law of Christ, okay? As for the Old Testament law, if you're going to say that this new law, the law of love, this New Testament law, love your neighbour of yourself, well, again, we were already looking at Galatians 5. He says, he, sa he says that you're not under the law. He's already pointed that out in Galatians 5. You have been called onto liberty. However, even though you're not under the law, you've been called onto liberty, don't use the liberty for an occasion of the flesh, but love and serve one another. Well, why? Because all the law is fulfilled in one word, that you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Well, again, that's an Old Testament law. It's not a New Testament law. It was there in the Old Testament. And he says, the law is fulfilled. Well, what law? The law of love, the law of Christ? No, because he hasn't mentioned the law of Christ yet until we get to chapter 6. He's, the context of this conversation, because we're dealing with circumcision, is Old Testament law. So you're not under Old Testament law, but nevertheless, if you love one another, you will fulfill that law. Okay, that's what Paul's arguing here. And so it just shows how he's just mixing everything up and just making it so confusing that you can't just read this like a normal letter. Okay, so before we actually study Galatians 6 closely, then let, let's just answer his question real brief. Okay, how can somebody sow to the Spirit, but then... Uh, if they if they then give up that they were never saved, how did they sow to the spirit if they were never saved to begin with? Okay, that that's that's what he's arguing about because again he believes in conditional security, so he, he's trying to frame it as well. If you can sow to the spirit, but then you can give up and lose your salvation, you, you must have still been sowing to the spirit. Otherwise, Galatians six doesn't make sense. So he's arguing that they must have been saved if they were sowing to the spirit. Otherwise, how did they sow to the spirit? Okay. Well, the way that he's trying to frame that question or, or even answer that question doesn't even make any sense because we have absolutes here. There, there's two camps of people. He that sows to his flesh shall of his flesh reap corruption. He that sows to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. Okay, so wh whoever that is, he that sows, he shall reap. So that that's an absolute. Okay, that that shall happen. It shall happen. So if he then says, let us not be wearing well doing for in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. That means we shall only reap if we faint not. And again, this, I'm just I'm just explaining this under a, par a paradigm where this even means what he was talking about. Okay, so the simple answer is if somebody's not saved, how can they sow to the spirit? Well, they can't. Because if they sow to the spirit, they should reap a life everlasting. But if they give up, and it turns out they're not saved and they don't reap life everlasting, well, how could they sow to the Spirit? They can't. They didn't. Because if they did, they would have reaped life everlasting. But because they didn't, they didn't reap life everlasting, therefore they didn't sow into the Spirit. Because, as we've already explained earlier in this refutation, salvation is yes or no. You are not slightly saved, a bit more saved, maybe, but you're either saved or you're not saved, okay? It's really one or the other. He He's trying to read this as a progressive journey, when salvation is just really yes or no, okay? There is no progression. You're either saved or you're not saved. And, it, and Paul's just putting us in two camps here. There's those that sow to the flesh and there's those that sow to the spirit. The idea of someone sowing to the spirit and sowing and sowing, so oh, he just dropped off because he stopped. So that's not offered by this passage here. There's just, there's just nothing to go on. He, he's just adding his own conjecture. And even under the conditional security model, it still doesn't work even under their model. Let me just explain to you why. So... Well, it's, again, this, the concept of sowing and reaping, okay? So this is a nice little chart for those of you that are quite visual. So on the vertical axis, we have sowing and reaping. The more you sow, the more you reap upwards. We then have time. Time is moving along from now until the future. Now, above the line, eternal life. Below the line, damnation, okay? So think of, just again, think about how stupid this is, okay? So we've got, we've got a man... Okay, and he, he starts sowing to the spirit. Okay, he's sowing to the spirit. He's sowing to the spirit. So he's sowing and he's sowing and he's reaping and he's reaping and he's reaping. And then for some reason, he does something here that Epiusium would say caused him to lose his salvation. So he goes and he goes and he goes all the way down here because he didn't, he, he's now lost his salvation. He's not going to reap eternal life. Well, all of this sowing that he did here, it doesn't matter how much he sowed. 
it doesn't matter how much he reaped, he did not reap eternal life. So even under their model, it doesn't work because all of this sowing and reaping, it doesn't matter whether he sowed a little bit. It doesn't matter whether he sowed more. It doesn't matter whether he sowed more than any other man on the planet. If he lost his salvation, he sowed nothing because he didn't reap this eternal life. Now, the Bible, Paul said, if he shall sow to the spirit, yeah, he shall reap life everlasting. That's what Paul said. If we don't give up. Well, this guy gives up. Well, Epiusian would say lost his salvation. So then he has to go here. Well, he didn't sow to the Spirit then, because any sowing he did was pointless anyway. He couldn't sow to the Spirit. So again, even in conditional security, this completely falls apart. And so it just shows why eternal security was already correct, because none of this matters anything. It doesn't matter. Nothing happened. He didn't sow to the Spirit, okay? And this is all assuming that that's even what Paul's talking about in this passage, which he isn't. So that was very easily debunked. That wasn't even difficult. So... Once again, as we've seen multiple times now, his explanations make absolutely no sense whatsoever. They just don't even fit with what Paul's even describing here. But let's now look at the verses and let, let's look a bit closer at what Paul's saying and let's actually take it in the context of what we've been reading up to now in Galatians. So let's just bring us up to speed where we were. So we were just finishing off Galatians 5, then starting Galatians 6. So Paul's already explained, you're not under the law, okay, you're under liberty, but don't use your liberty as an occasion for the flesh, because if you love your neighbour, you shall fulfil the law anyway, but you're not under that law, okay, that's what Paul's been arguing up until this point. And so then he's going to, you know, encourage the brethren to restore one another if one's overtaken in a fault, uh, bear one another's burdens. Uh, we saw that the law of Christ, really, that there's not really a lot explained as to what Paul means by that. But if it, if it meant Old Testament law, well, we're not under the law as far as salvation's concerned anyway. And if he's saying it's a New Testament thing, well, we're under liberty now. Okay, we're not under a, a condemn condemning law otherwise you can't really say that we're under liberty and there's, there's not really any re reason to replace the old testament law even that would be pointless so that that's what we've been reading leading up to uh, getting on the next verses in galatians 6 so paul did kind of move the conversation on a little bit because he's now saying you know bear one another's burdens uh, you know lo love one another and so he then goes and say let every man prove his own work now he's already explained you know the works of the law they're not a part of salvation so where, you know, every man prove his own work, every man shall bear his own burden, uh, he shall rejoice in himself alone and, and not in another. So this is not about bragging to be saved or anything like that, but, you know, you're under the spirit, well, let's love one another, every man prove his own work, okay? And so on. So then he goes on to say, be not deceived, and again, this is the key bit that we've got to deal with for uh, because of Epiusion's false teaching here, that God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Okay, so he that sows to his flesh shall of his flesh reap corruption. Okay, he that sows to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And so there's a, there's a few things. It, it is quite a tricky couple of verses when you first look at it, because if you just take those verses on their own like he did, it does make it look like, you know, there's some work involved because you've got to sow to the spirit is in do some work to reap this life everlasting business okay but but to read it that way you'd a have to kind of ignore the overall context of the conversation that paul's been having with them up to now and b you'd also have to just ignore other parts of the bible as well and make paul sound like a crazy person who just contradicts himself left right and center so let, let's try and look at this with a bit of scope okay so that we don't get things wrong here so what do we know from other writings of paul well we know from ephesians that salvation is a gift, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. We know from Romans that righteousness is a free gift. So if salvation, if righteousness is a free gift, okay, the gift of God is life everlasting, you can't then work, sorry, sorry, it's flipping out on me just a moment, you can't then sow and, and reap like work, okay, for something that's a free gift, right? That, that doesn't work. It just doesn't, you, you can't work for a free gift that that falls apart immediately so you can't even take that verse to mean that because if it did it would contradict the bible your salvation your eternal life your righteousness is a free gift case closed so it can't mean that otherwise paul contradicted himself here's another problem epiusion will say that where it says shall of the flesh reap corruption that means go to hell and shall of the spirit reap life everlasting that means go to heaven well, again, we've got another problem here, because you're putting words in Paul's mouth like hell that Paul didn't say. If this is so serious, okay, if, if 
sowing to your flesh can cause you to lose salvation and take you to hell, Paul needs to use more clear language than an ambiguous statement like shall of the flesh reap corruption. Because there's, there's a number of different things that could even mean, okay? So, again, you, you're accusing Paul of using fluffy, vague language for something that we really better be right about. We, re, we really need clear teaching on this, okay? So, you know, believe it or not, I can't even actually find in the concordance where Paul even mentioned the word hell directly. So don't don't put words in Paul's mouth that he never actually said, okay? Next thing to point out, so earlier when we were looking at his proof text from Galatians 5 about losing his salvation, we saw that the letter was more addressed to um, the people that he's writing towards directly. So you, the churches at Galatia, you, plural, this, that, and the other. Well, now he's using slightly different language because now he's saying things like, for he that sows to the Spirit shall of, uh, you know, to his flesh, he that sows to uh, the Spirit shall shall of the spirit reap a life everlasting so we're now using more individualized uh, language okay and it, it's not even saying if you do these things then this shall happen and if you do these things that shall happen like all of the churches at galatia will either go one way or the other this is just about for he whoever he is because you know this is a this is an indirect pronoun so he whether it's him or it's him over there or it's him down there whoever he is and, we, and we've got two camps of people. So we've got he that sows to his flesh, and we've got he that sows to his spirit. Okay. And then he goes on to say, uh, for in due season, we collectively shall reap if we fate not. So, you know, if we keep going, and so this is not about you personally. If It doesn't say if he keeps going, in, he will fate not. Okay. This is just we, the churches at Galatia, all of us who are the brethren, uh, let us not be weary in well-doing, because in due season uh, we faint not. So there it's individualised in verse 8, whereas in verse 9 it's more collective. And and this is the stuff that people like Epiusin, they just completely ignore this. You know, they, they take that he and they make that the same thing as we. Well, see, you've got to sow to the, the, the Spirit and then you've not got to not give up, okay? But that's not what Paul said. He said, if we don't uh, don't faint, you know, we will reap, okay? We collectively. So there's a collective reaping going on here, okay? And there's a collective, we must not faint. Let's keep fighting together. Let's keep battling this thing together, what, whatever it happens to be. We keep going. We don't give up. Let us collectively not be weary in well-doing, and we collectively shall reap, okay? It's not he personally shall reap if he personally does not give up. That's not what Paul said. And again, don't put words in his mouth that he didn't freaking say, because it gets on my nerves when people do that. So with the he, then, let's deal with the individualized. We've got two camps of people. There's just two types of people. The idea of a third person that was sowing in the spirit and then suddenly starts sowing in the flesh is not offered here. Okay, we've got two types of people. And you'll find that this pattern actually comes up quite often across the Bible, like in the Gospel of John. We've got he who believes in is not condemned, and he who believes not is condemned already. The idea of someone who believes and then stops believing is just not offered by that passage. Uh, you know, you've got him who abides and him who doesn't abide. You've really often got two camps of people. So to make someone who was in this camp and that camp, we really need a third type of person. And that th third type of person is missing from a lot of their go-to passages. Okay, so we've got he that sows to his flesh. That's type one of a person. Okay, and we've got he that sows to the spirit. And that's type two of a person. OK, there it is. So we've just got two types of people. There is no crisscrossing going on here. That There's just not no text to go. And if you want to say there's crisscrossing going on here, we've just got him who's going that way and him who's going that way. He's sowing to the flesh. He's over there sowing to the spirit. OK, and we will not. We better faint not. We will reap all if we faint not. OK, so the we there presumably being the people who are walking in the spirit, because that's what he's telling them to do. Now then. What has Paul been explaining in Galatians 5? He warned them about circumcision, okay? And how did he introduce his uh, book? He introduced it about people, uh, those among you that were troubling you, bringing in these false gospels. That's what he was warning them about. So there's these false gospels. And at that time, at least in Galatia, it predominantly revolved around the circumcision issue, okay? And those who are in the circumcision camp, their flesh will profit them nothing. That was Paul's argument. And just in case you've forgotten about that, well, I think he's talking about something else now. Well, then he reminds you in these later verses, just in case you forgot about it, okay? 
that many desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, okay? And they want to glory in your flesh, okay? And they want to keep the law, which were not under the law. So, again, this is the bit that Epiusium doesn't want you to look at. This is the bit he doesn't point out to you, okay? So those that are in the flesh, according to the Galatians narrative, it's not, well, the Christian who was walking in the spirit and then started sinning. That's not going on here at all, okay? Those who are in the flesh are the circumcision group, okay? That's who they are. All right, and so to the, the the sowing to the spirit is what we are supposed to be, and that's why once we get to verse nine, it goes on to the we instead of the he. Okay, those of us that are walking in the spirit, collectively, not individual persons, we need to faint not. Okay, so this does not teach that you can lose your salvation. You've got nothing to go on here. You are completely butchering what Paul is talking about if you make it say that. That's not what he said. Okay, now let's pick up on the issue of what he actually reaps, okay? Verse 8, he that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, okay? And he that sows to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. So again, he that's in that camp, he reaps from the flesh. He that reaps that camp, he reaps from the spirit. Okay, the idea that, again, there's some crisscrossing going on here is just not offered at all by this verse. Now, if you were going to, if you were going to teach that he, he that uh, reaps to the flesh shall of the flesh, shall, shall go to hell, sorry, shall lose his salvation. Well, then this statement doesn't make sense of the flesh because now it's your soul that's reaping corruption. Okay, not the flesh. Now, if this were talking about a believer, so if there was a, a danger of a believer sowing to the flesh by doing the works of the flesh that he previously explained, like fornication, adultery, this, that, and the other, well, then it wouldn't be of his flesh. It, it would, his spirit would be reaping corruption because he would be losing his salvation and going to hell, but it's the flesh that reaps corruption. Well, much earlier in this refutation, we dealt with what happens to believers that sinned. They suffered in the flesh. David, his child died. Abraham, he never saw his son again, presumably, or very little of him from that point. Um, Saul died by falling on his own sword. Okay, we saw examples of people's flesh that, that was corrupt. Now, Jesus Christ, his flesh shall not see corruption as it was prophesied. He rose again three days later, his flesh didn't even see corruption. But that only applies to him. It doesn't apply to anybody else. And your flesh here is still dying anyway, okay? You have not been born into some new fleshly body that's powered by the Spirit now. You're still in flesh and blood, and that's dying. It's a future resurrection that we hope for, which Paul explains in plenty of other places, okay? So that doesn't even make sense, that you can take that to mean you will go to hell when it's the flesh that reaps corruption, okay? Now, if we actually understand it in its proper context, that those who are of the flesh were the circumcision group, well, what did Paul say about these people? Well, he said they uh, they were trying to bring you under the works of the law, okay? That's what they were trying to do, the works of the law. Circumcision is just one of the works of the law. If you're going to be circumcised, well, you're a debtor to the whole law. So you can't just say, well, we still have to love our neighbour, though, because then you're still a debtor to the whole law, however we spin this. So he said that they want you to follow the works of the law. And what else did he say about them? Well, he introduced his letter to the Galatians, saying that there be some that trouble you, and they were bringing in a different gospel or a false gospel. Okay, so those that reap corruption of the flesh, their flesh is reaping works of the law salvation. It's reaping circumcision to be saved. It's reaping false gospels, okay? That can get nobody saved. They preach a false gospel. A false gospel is getting nobody to heaven. So that's why they reap corruption, because their gospel is of the flesh. It's not It's not of the spirit, okay? Now then, that's them dealt with. What about the spirit people? He that sows to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. So that you could just take that to be the opposite of the other people. The people that were sowing to the flesh, well, they had their false gospel. They had their circumcision gospel. They had their works of the law gospel. So those that reap to the spirit shall reap life everlasting. That's that's the opposite gospel. Okay, that's the opposite to to what they're all doing. Okay. Now we've already explained salvation is a free gift. You can't make this about earning your own salvation when it's a free gift. Jesus gives freely. So what is it that he sows, and what is it that he reaps? Bearing in mind, we start off with he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for it says we shall reap if we faint not. Okay, so 
what is sowing in, in terms of if if we're presumably dealing with the false gospels and the right gospels what is the sowing that goes on okay well this is this is not really explained here there are other passages sort of parallel passages that you could use to explain this okay so let, let's have a look at some stuff that jesus said so one passage that comes to mind is the parable of the sower okay jesus uses a similar concept there's there's the sowing there okay so people he gives this parable a sower went out and he sowed his seed and the seed fell in various different places now to some seed that sprouted believers to others it sprouted false believers or just people who temporarily and then it were choked up so you know different kind of seed falls in different places and in some parts it's fruitful in other parts it's not fruitful so it, when it falls on good ground it's fruitful when it doesn't fall on good ground something else happens to it and it doesn't bring forth fruit okay he then has to explain his disciples what he means by this parable so he says the seed is the word of god okay that's what's being sown that's what's being planted okay you sow the seed of the word of god here let me show you what the bible says about this life everlasting business you know do you believe you would go to heaven well let me show you what the bible says the word of god okay the word of god brings life okay and so a lot of seed falls in various places and uh, in some cases it's not fruitful so for some the word of god falls by the wayside the devil gets them lest they should believe and be saved so there's some seed where unfortunately they're not going to believe and be saved because the, the seed that you planted that that sowing that you did it just falls by the wayside it didn't fall in the right place okay not necessarily the sower's fault but that's just where it ended up there's some that will receive the word of joy, uh, word with joy, and they will for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. And of course, that's one he's going to take, as you can lose your salvation. But we already dealt with that in John chapter six. That they from Jesus knew from the beginning they believe not. So again, you'll you'll see some temporary results where it looked like your sowing actually reaped something, but then it turned out it never did. Okay, you, you just ended up with a plant that you thought would grow fruit when it didn't. That's just how it is. There's some that uh, fell among the thorns and they were just choked by the, the things of this world. So again, you, you've thrown your seed, you've done your sowing, but some seed that you threw just fell on thorns. Okay, it didn't reap anything. But then some of the seed, so at least a quarter of the seed that you've thrown falls on good ground. Okay, which in an honest and good halving heard the word keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. And it's bring forth fruit. That's that's not talking about work there because that's outside of the concept of what he's talking about here. But you, you've planted the seeds in somebody, you've given them the word of God, they've believed, they've got saved, there's the fruit. Okay. Now there's actually another uh, passage where Jesus talks about, once again, a very similar concept of sowing and reaping okay for the purpose of life everlasting because that's what galatians said remember he said we uh, he shall of the spirit reap life everlasting that's what he's going to gather in from the sowing that he's doing okay well we see in luke chapter 8 that that will be if he sows seed on the good ground he's going to reap that okay it's getting other people saved it's not getting himself saved because he was saved by the free gift whosoever believeth so let's look at the parallel passage here's another one john 4 jesus talks about from verse 34 and was my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish the work now he was giving the gospel to the uh, samaritan woman at the well and he's giving the gospel to other samaritans in this chapter so uh, there are yet four months and then comes harvest behold i say unto you lift up your eyes and look out on the field they are white all ready to harvest these samaritans this city it's out there it's ready to harvest the harvest is there folks and so again we've got this concept of reaping however Jesus says something slightly different here. This is interesting. He says, he that reaps receives wages and gathers fruit unto life eternal. Well, what's the context? He's not making his own life eternal. He's getting other people safe. These Samaritans that Jesus is going to reach out to. Both he that sows and he that reaps may rejoice together. Okay, well, you sowed you reaped but let, let's rejoice together okay collectively rejoicing and herein is that saying true one sows and another reaps now paul was saying he that sows shall reap whereas jesus is saying well that one sows and another one reaps okay uh, so there, you're even reaping where you've bestowed no labor even so let's then bring that what we've learned about jesus's words there going out into the fields getting those samaritans saved reaping okay what another man has sown let's bring this into galatians well paul said he that sows to the spirit shall reap ever life everlasting well what's the reaping 
getting other people saved with the right gospel, not the false gospel of works of the law, not the false gospel of circumcision. That's what Paul called another gospel, okay? It's the faith, the household of faith, he goes on to say, the faith, okay? So let us not be weary in well-doing because we shall reap if we faint not. So, you know, it's very easy. If you're one that you feel like you're so into the spirit and you're not reaping personally, you know what? Someone else might be reaping from the work you've done. You might have sown the seed, someone else reaps. So a lot of my evangelism is really kind of hit it and quit it. We just, we turn up to a door, show them the gospel, and then we leave and we'll probably never see them again. But I don't know what's going on later in that person's life. I don't know if he found a church of true believers. I don't know if he, he may have not even got saved at the door, but he gets saved later. Okay. And, so, and, and then he may be fellowships with somebody else. And I'll never, never know that that happened. But I sowed though, but somebody else reaps. So it doesn't matter that we don't reap our own sowing, okay? What matters is that we together reap, and so we faint not, we all keep on going. And he said earlier, let every man prove his own work, and then he shall have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. So you can't just keep on doing this reaping, and then you rejoice in what somebody else has done. Let him rejoice in his own work, he did the sowing, and you can have the reaping, and you can rejoice in, in your reaping, okay? So all of this makes absolute perfect sense. It's got nothing to do with what Epiusion's talking about. And even if you actually follow it through, it proves him wrong. Okay, so there you go. That's what Galatians is actually teaching you. So he that sows to the spirit shall reap life everlasting. You know, he that's actually saved, he that sows to the spirit, he can now get other people saved. Whereas he that sows to the flesh with his another gospel, he's not going to get anybody saved. He just reaps corruption from the flesh, okay? That's what Buddhism reaps. That's what Catholicism reaps. It just reaps corruption. It just ma makes false believers, okay? They don't get born again. So that's pretty much Galatians in a nutshell for you. So I'll just uh, move on to um, another passage, I guess. <laughs> 